Hey guys, Hypolast here with something a little bit different this time. This time I'm going to take a look at the Kanage deck that I used in my first video, and then we're going to play a few games with some live commentary. So starting off, taking a look at Kanage himself. Kanage starts with 2 Might and 1 Destiny. With this deck, we're going to want to go up to 6 Might, 4 Magic, and 2 Destiny. After that, you can just draw a card. The other thing about Kanage is he has access to two fantastic schools of magic, Light and Water. Now, the main thing we're going to want from Light is Anael and Blinding Light, two very powerful cards that fit into our strategy really well. Water, I'm pretty sure all of the Sanctuary heroes are water aligned. This gives us access to Geyser and Ice Spikes, two also very powerful spells. Geyser actually combos really nicely with what a lot of Sanctuary cards are trying to do. For his abilities, he has his regular abilities, and he also has this one. For one mana, we can make all the Naga creatures in my hand cost three mana. Now, this pretty much never comes up. Basically, the Naga creature, if you're only playing one, has to cost five or more. We do have the Lotus Guards, and I think a couple other in there that would benefit from that, but typically, if you're that high up, you really just want to be drawing a card instead. So, moving on to the creatures. We've got Shark Guard on our low end. Now, this guy doesn't have fantastic stats. A lot of the time, he just ends up getting blocked off. But really, you just want something to play on turn 1. You don't really want to end up going too slow, and you can move things in front of a Shark Guard with your outmaneuver ability in order to use this guy a little bit later in the game. Spring Spirit and Kabuki Sentry make up your two really early plays that you want to be making. These two guys grab board control really well, make it kind of awkward for your opponent to play on the rows that they exist on. Both of them are going to be hitting for two, and that means that they're going to be able to take out most early drops, most one and two drops that your opponents are going to be playing if they get the first attack in. Spring Spirit, uh, if she's being evenly matched with a flyer or a melee, for example a harpy from Cat, then she's going to be able to take that out after retaliation damage, and in the case of the harpy, Spring Spirit just straight up always wins. Uh, Coral Priestess, Sayama Champion, and Seductress make up our three drops. Coral Priestess isn't really a three drop though. We want to be using her later on in the game once we have some board control. We want to move stuff either out of the way when it would eat our creatures for free, or we want to move stuff into the way when we control the row really powerfully. Sayama Champion is the main creature we're using for catch up. We want to be a little bit behind on the board going into the mid game. That's going to make our Sayama Champion a crazy 3-3-6 for just 3 mana, We're only requiring 3 might as well, and usually after your opponent has traded a little bit, he's going to be starting on your turn as a 3-3-6 in the middle game. Kabiki Seductress is coming down mostly to save your creatures in the early game. When you have something that's at pretty low health and it's facing off against something that also has low health, you can bring down the Seductress, stop their, your opponent's monster from attacking you, and then you'll be able to kill it on the next turn. Basically just buy your guys a little bit of time, keep that board control going. In the late game, this is also a fantastic stall card. She can stop your opponent's biggest threats, for example, if they have a Raya or an Anael or any kind of crazy uniques out, you can just stop them, bring them out of the game for a turn, give yourself some time to breathe. Now, Wanazami is your only 4-drop. This is what you're going to be using once you've started achieving board control. The Honor 1 comes down and really gives you a grip over the board. A lot of people don't anticipate the Honor 1. They're willing to put stuff in front that would survive with just 1 or 2 health, and oftentimes a 1 Azami or 2 can come down and really change the flow of battle for the turn. Naga Tidemasters. We're playing 3 of these, along with Raya as our 5 drops. Tidemasters are basically just because the Coral Priestesses are so powerful, we just want the outmaneuver on even more cards. So we play those, they're also pretty large. 4 attack is very powerful, and as a shooter, that 6 health is going to last you a really long time. Raya is pretty much what we're always digging for. If you can get a Raya out, you're in a very good position. The ability to lock something down from attacking every single turn is extremely powerful, and she has an effect as soon as she hits the board, which is really important as well. Anael, this is where the 6 might comes into play, along with Lotus Empire Guard, is one of our win conditions. We're typically going to be using Anael when a line is very strong for our opponents. She's going to come down, completely block off the line with her 9 health, and hopefully destroy the line with 5 attack and charge on the next turn. Lotus Empire Guard. I'm only playing 2 of these right now. I've thought about playing 3, 
but I'm not so sure because they are very expensive. Usually on turn 6 you don't actually have 6 might because you do need to get up to 3 magic to cast most of your spells uh, and 4 magic in order to cast the rest of them actually. So usually you're sitting at 3 magic and either 4 or 5 might by the time you get up to turn 6. So this is more like a turn 8 play. Preemptive Strike is very good, kind of serving the same purpose as Anael for blocking off a single row, though he has the added effect of if you are behind on the board, if your opponent has more things than you, then everything has to attack him, even if they're not on the same row as him, they actually gain attack anywhere. The 3 Preemptive Strike makes that really inconvenient for flyers and melees. Unfortunately, if your opponent has a strong shooter presence, they can sometimes take him down for free. So that is one thing you need to be kind of careful of. And I've actually had times where I play this not realizing what's going to happen. My opponent kills off a couple of my guys and then manages to use all four of their shooters to take out my Lotus Empire guard without him doing anything. So that is just something you need to be aware of. Your opponent sometimes has tricks with this. The other thing about Lotus Empire Guard is that he can't actually be targeted. So if you're playing against a control deck, then it's just nice knowing that he can't be hit by a lightning bolt, he can't be hit by a geyser, he can't be hit by a blinding light. Basically when you play him, your opponent's going to have to deal with him through combat. Moving on to our spells, we're just playing a decent suite of removal. We've got lots of positional removal, Sun Blaze, Ice Spikes, Geyser. Not so much Word of Light, but these three particularly. These are going to be comboing with our outmaneuver spells, moving our opponent's creatures into bad positions. For example, if they're spacing their guys correctly for a geyser, we can take one of them, toss it in the middle, and then geyser three or four guys pretty consistently. Word of Light just to clean up anything that's surviving, and Blinding Light for the big stuff. This is the main reason that we're in Light, other than Anael. We're playing four Blinding Lights, and this card is fantastic. Saved me in so many times. Now, one thing to remember about Blinding Light is that it just phases and makes the enemy not able to attack. For all intents and purposes, they're not there, but your opponent also can't use that cell on the board. So you can actually use this to really clog up their board with useless monsters, and... It's just really powerful, especially if you have good control over the row that uh, you've played Blinding Light on. For Fortunes, we just have the two of them. We have Time of Need. This is primarily going to be grabbing Raya, though sometimes you're going to be grabbing Anil if you just need to close up the game, and Revised Tactics. Now, missing of note in this deck is Dark Lotus Pond, and I'm just going to pull that up for people who don't know what it is. Dark Lotus Pond lets you search your opponent's deck for four cards and banish them, but it also shuffles their hand in, so if the card was in their hand, you get to banish it. Now, this is an interesting card. The first thing that I'm not really a big fan of is that it costs three destiny, and as we saw, Kanage only starts off with one, and so you need to invest two turns increasing your destiny in order to actually use the Dark Lotus Pond. The second thing is, it's not actually card advantage. Your opponent ends up with the same number of cards in their hand and on their board as when you started, but you're down the Dark Lotus Pond. What it does do very well is get rid of threats and remove their win conditions. So, for example, if I'm playing against a Surya, or really any Necropolis hero, and they're playing Banshees, they've got a ton of ways to re replay their Banshees. They've probably got Surya's Last Orders, they've probably got Surya's Legion, then I would really like to get this Dark Lotus Bond down on turn 4, get all 4 of their Banshees out of their deck, and get rid of all those combos right out of the, right out of the gates. Now, unfortunately that doesn't really come up, and with Kanage, you uh, really need to invest in that 3 Destiny. So you're going out of your way to cast a spell that might not even really have an impact on the game. Uh, if you were seeing nothing but Surya's, and in fact if you were playing against nothing but Inferno decks as well, they've got some cards that you really need to deal with, then Dark Lotus Pond is fantastic. If you're playing against regular mid-range decks, which I've been seeing a lot of Cat on the ladder, and I've been seeing a lot of Vampire Necropolis on the ladder, then Dark Lotus Pond loses a lot of its value. As you can see, both the fortunes that I'm playing only require two Destiny. Kanage does cap out at 2 Destiny, which is really nice, means that I only need to bump my Destiny once in order to be playing everything. For my events, I have 3 Rise of the Nethermancer, this is just to stop all of those pesky Necropolis reanimation decks, but also to try to stop Phoenixes that my opponent would want to play. 2 Cosmic Balances, I have seen a few combo decks, though they aren't very popular at the point that I'm on at the ladder right now, but Cosmic Balance is always nice to have in reserve and three Week of the Elder Races. If you take a look at our creatures, most of these are Nagas. I think the only ones that aren't Nagas are Anael, 
this Wanazame and the Shark Guard. Everything else is a Naga. Oh, sorry, the Spring Spirit also isn't. Everything else, though, is a Naga. So usually if you're activating a week of the Elder Races, you're giving at least half of your board, plus one, plus one, and that is going to hurt. So that's the deck. That's pretty much how I play it. I'm going to head over to the ladder and hop into a couple games, so I will see you guys when the first game is starting.